I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. Is a business a painkiller or a vitamin? I am so pleased to have spoken with Tony Fidel, who made all of the products that have changed your life, or at least they've changed my life. The, the iPod, the iPod Touch, the iPhone, the Nest thermometer. He made and designed all of these things. Some of these, of course, while working at Apple, and then he built up his own company, Nest, which he sold for over $3 billion to Google. And he just wrote a book called Build, An Unorthodox Guide to Making Things Worth Making by Tony Fidel and he's donating the, the proceeds of he gets from the book to all things climate change related. But he to hear his stories about the development of the iPod and the iPhone and Nest and all the things that were important to him and what should be important to any entrepreneur, particularly are you solving a pain point or are you making things better? What's more important? We had a great discussion. Here it is. Uh, so a lot of time also people doesn't read manual, you know, like you shouldn't have to, if it's designed properly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like now, like you, I feel like you've designed everything in my life right now. Having read your book. <laughs> like I remember the first day and I'm sure you get this story all the time, but the first day I had an iPod, I couldn't stop smiling. Like it was unbelievable. <laughs> a perma because, smile. Yeah. It was a perma smile because all this music, every song that I had ever loved was available to me and i never realized how much i had wanted that before i didn't even know such a magical thing was possible <laughs> and so i was smiling all day and i remember it was a christmas party i was going to and then i had it in my coat and somebody at the coat check someone working at the coat just stole my coat and i or no stole the ipod out of my coat Aww. and so so my first iPod was stolen within 24 hours, ruining my happiness. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, what I will say is it's great to go back to old iPods if you haven't used them in a while and you see all your old, it's like a snapshot of all your music from that window of time. It's so much yeah. fun. To, and then you have no notification distractions, nothing else. It's just pure music. You're like, oh. Oh, and then even better though, the iTouch. That ah. was amazing. Like suddenly... I was, I, I, I was on a trip. I was in Houston of, of all places and I bought an iTouch 
and I knew you could get videos on this thing. So I downloaded, I had never watched the TV show Lost before. This was in the middle. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm taking the whole plane back watching this incredible show. Like it was the first binge watching I had ever done it was on an iTouch. And that changed my life. Yeah, it's it's amazing. iPod Touch is still around now, and they got updated, but uh, it's still around, and it's uh, it's really it's it's really cool. Yeah, they still have an iPod. Why would someone buy an iTouch? Well, I guess if you have kids, ah, uh, kids, they okay, also use parent. it for remote controls around their house where they don't need a wire. You know, they don't need a a five G or four G you know connection. So it's cheaper, and you can just you know like you literally home re a remote control. And so now, music players. Were, or I had never gotten any of these MP3 players before the iPod, but music players were around before the iPod, obviously. What, what made me buy an iPod and not buy any of these? M I had zero interest in buying an MP3 player. I didn't think I needed it. I didn't care. I didn't realize how much I needed it until after I had an iPod. But like, why, in your opinion, why did I buy an iPod rather than for the years prior buy an MP3 player? Well, the MP3 players, well, first the name, MP3 player. What the hell's that? No one knows what right. that means. But but look, at the at the beginning, there was only two, before the iPod, there was only two things you could buy. You could either buy a little uh, like memory-based one that would hold like 10 to 20 songs. And you'd have to load it on and load it off. Like it was easier to put a CD in a CD Walkman or something, then load files on slowly. And then, so every time you wanted 20 songs, you had like, you had to go through this whole rigmarole. So that was one type. And the other type was a hard drive based one, which was really big. There was no small hard drives. So you had this really big thing. It took hours to load it up. It didn't have long battery life. It had a horrible interface. So when you had tons of music on this big thing, you couldn't even find the music you wanted to listen to if you got it on there in the first place and if you had enough battery life. So it was like, it was, they, they were all in, they, they were all these at the fringes. It wasn't really made for, you know, mere mortals. It was for geeks. Right, but you know, so, so you're suggesting that some of it is tech issues, some of it's design issues. You got to Apple, what, what changed? Did the technology change more or did you think more about the design? Like what, well, what happened? So what happened specifically at Apple's one is, you know, one was how do you just make it as easy as listening to music, right? So the first thing you listen to music traditionally at that point in time. So the first one was how do I get, you know, how do I make it really snappy? In other words, how do I get songs onto it and off of it? And that was, we used Firewire, which was much, much faster than USB at the time because USB has now gone on. But back then USB was just for keyboards and mice. It was really slow. So we were able mm. to use Firewire, which was only on Apple computers. So it was very, mm. very fast. Secondly, it had long, long battery life. Third, it had an interface when you put a thousand songs or 2000 songs on, the, on it, um, you could actually get to it. And the scroll wheel was just, you know, it was buttery. It was like, ah, oh, I could find my stuff so, so fast. So it was fun to do that, right? Was there, was there a technology improvements in storage? Like how did you get thousands of songs? Oh on? yeah, so, so at the time there was, there was just memory chips that were really not very dense. So you couldn't, you, like I said, store about 15 to 20 songs. And then you could get big hard drives from a laptop. So those were three and a half inch drives, like about that big, or five and a quarter inch drives. Well, what happened was at that very same time, there was a, a Toshiba came out with a, a, a 2.5 inch drive that fit into a PC card slot. They look like, you know, they look like credit cards. And so we were able to take that hard drive that had just come out and Toshiba just wanted to do, put it in laptops. And I said, let's use it in this music player. Let's get an exclusive on that so no one else could get it because Toshiba's like, I don't know about music players. I don't care anything about music players. So we signed up with Toshiba for an exclusivity period of like three to mm -hmm. four years. So we were the only ones to get that special technology and wrap all the Apple magic around it. Man, that, that changed my <laughs> life. And then, well, here's, here's the question. Like you must've known people were going to love this. Like you, like unlike many products where you don't really know in advance and you discuss this in the, in your book, uh, you must've known people were going to want this because people were, there was already a market for MP3s and this was clearly better in every way. It was a tiny market to tell you the truth. It was a mm. tiny market. It was an insignificant market. The brands were insignificant. It, it was literally a geek product and they almost all of them came from Korea and they were mm. named all these weird names. Nobody knew that it was there. What people wanted was music. They didn't want MP3s and they wanted it very easy to use. Mm. So, and also through my, you know, you said, I thought it, you know, I, I, I believed it was gonna be success. 
through my through my disasters experience at General Magic and all these other places where I failed for 10 years. And Apple, you have to remember at the time, was not the Apple you know it today. Apple was worth maybe $4 billion, not $3 trillion. It had $500 million in debt. It was barely break even as a company. And so to know that iPod would be a success, one, as a product, and two, to help Apple get out of the hole it was in, that was definitely not going to happen. It, I, it took a long time for me to believe that I even want to join the company to finish what I started. Were you nervous about working with Steve Jobs? I mean, you mentioned in the book <laughs> to some extent, but what, what were your fears and how did they address them before you got, went to work there? Well, I think I heard a lot of stories. I worked with, uh, at a, with a team at General Magic. General Magic was the Mac team minus Steve Jobs in the 90s, trying to create the iPhone 15 years too soon, basically. Mm -hmm. And so I got to hear all the stories from the people who worked on the Mac with Steve and all these crazy stories when he was much younger. So I was, you know, and I had only met him once before at a birthday party. And I was like, ah, to go to my first meeting with him, I didn't know what to do. And literally after the end of a two and a half, three hour meeting with the first iPod pitch to him, I was like, oh my God, he's, I, almost all of that stuff was fabricated in my brain, you know, based on, you know, hearsay and, and rumors from, and, and stories uh, and some crazy image of Steve, but it was great. It was a wonderful time to work with Steve. Of course, he held your feet to the fire and would never let go and was relentless on the details. But that was what was so wonderful to work with him on. It was was those those details. And sometimes he was wrong. And sometimes he was very, very right. But it was great to have that creative tension, conflict. And, and sometimes we were just all see eye to eye and we just made things happen. So, um, but, but, it was, but it was fun. What was the time when you were wrong, but you were convinced you were right and he was right and talked you into it or forced you into it or whatever? Forced us into Well, I think we were all like, are we going to be able to put a power button? Like, we were all like, well, we got to put a power button in the iPod. And he, and he was like, no, we're not putting a power button. And we were all like, Steve, come on, put a power button on it. And so, and so we had to walk through all of the things. We had a very limited time because we shipped the thing in, you know, nine, ten months. So we had no time for design. So what happened was we didn't get a power button. We got the hold button which the hold button, uh, once you powered it off, you press and hold the menu button. I can't remember the play pause, whatever it was, it would shut it down and then you'd click the hold button off. So if you hit the keys or the click wheel, it wouldn't turn on again. So it was kind of halfway. We got, we didn't have a power button. We had this hold switch that would make sure it would stay off. So, you know, be it as it may. Now on the other side, you know, was where we were all convinced it couldn't work and where he said it had to work which was we were making an iPod plus a phone. So it was an iPod classic with a screen and a wheel. And we were going to try to make an iPod phone with a, you know, a, a wire, you know, with your headset with a microphone on it. And that would be the way you could uh, make calls, right? You could listen and, and talk. And so we were working really hard to try to figure out how to put a phone inside of the iPod with a click wheel inter interface. And we worked weeks and weeks and weeks on that thing. I think it was like six to eight weeks. And when everybody was convinced it wouldn't work, Steve was like, it's got to work. We got to make it work. And ultimately, it turned into the iPhone. So, so there, was, there was one of those things where it just happened. But sometimes when we push, 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 we get to a point. And sometimes when we push, 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 we didn't get anywhere, but we learned and we moved on. And we were so sure that we were right and we knew that it wouldn't work or it would work. We could move on in confidence. So, so I guess when, you know, you had all these constraints on you, like you had to, you know, keep the wheel and, and, uh, you had to keep the rough design. You had technological constraints, obviously, and you had deadlines and Steve jobs saying, we have to do this. So is that kind of the, the innovation of the touch screen for, for dialing and for everything on the iPhone is essentially you were, you had, you were, you were pregnant with this and you had to force it out some way. So the touchscreen solved a lot of your design issues. Well, look, we had a lot of different things going on at the time. We had the iPod plus phone, which I just discussed. And then there was a, a full screen iPod. Okay. And what that was, was because we were doing video at the time. You talked about the iPod touch, right? When you got to, yeah. to watch all those, the binge watch. And so what we were trying to do was make, we would take the wheel off the iPod, make the full thing full screen so you could watch videos on it. And we put a virtual wheel on it. 
So mm, it was a touchscreen right. with a wheel. It was a single touch touchscreen with a wheel on it. And so you could watch all of it and your interface wouldn't, wouldn't have the physical buttons. So that was another project that was going on. And then there was a third project going on, which was the touchscreen Mac. So over in mm. another part of the company, there was a, a team working on this full, a, a ping pong table sized multi-touch screen. It wasn't, it wasn't in, you know, able to be made small yet because we were still, you know, prototyping and working on it. And those three things came together. So the full screen, uh, a video iPod, the iPod plus phone and the touch screen Mac, multi-touch Mac all came together. And that's what drove the, you know, the, the base technology pieces for what would become the iPhone. Now, given the pressure that was on you from Steve Jobs, did you ever, and you talk a lot about hiring and employees, but you also talk a lot about assholes, the different type of assholes <laughs> that you have. You have a chapter called assholes. So yeah. credit, credit to you for just titling that, that chapter. But, uh, uh, did you ever get nervous? You wouldn't be able to meet the expectations because someone on your team was not quite performing. Well, you know, I, I guess you could say that, you know, we always, we had to have the highest performers and if not, sometimes they knew they weren't and they would leave because they knew they were, you know, or we had to ask them to leave. Right. That happened very rarely to tell you the truth, um, because we were always able to, you know, cause the team was growing and what have you, but yeah, no, there were times when, you know, it was a real challenge, uh, to get the whole team to be aligned with. And I, a lot of times, you know, people, managers and leaders, they go, okay, we need to get this done, but they don't talk about why. They don't talk about the mission. They don't talk about exactly what was the reason why, even though it might be hard, why we need to make this thing happen. And so that was the, the wonderful thing um, that Steve did was we had discussions on the why, not just, uh, you know, not just the what and get it done. So we talked about the why, and then I could then, you know, we could, we could talk about the whys and argue that, and then I could bring that decision back to the team and talk about not just what to get done, but why we're going to get it done and why these other things don't work and why we think this will work. And this was a discussion we had with the group as opposed to it just coming down on high and we just have to go, oh, make this happen. And so when, when, when the team got educated about these things, they were like, oh, now I understand. Now I'm going to work really hard because that is the point. This is why it means so much to the end user, the customer as opposed to somebody just told me to do it. And that's really a key point in the book, which is make sure you understand the why of everything, not just the why of the product, but the why you're doing something. What's the mission? What's the goals to drive and motivate people to do their best work possible? But you do mention something. I mean, you talk a lot about how to judge an idea and, and you said something very interesting. You said that ideas are painkillers and not vitamins. Correct. The best products are painkillers. Why? because people need them. People, some people buy vitamins because they think they're going to help. They, or they might be placebos. Other people buy painkillers. When you have back pain, when you have a headache, you buy that to get rid of that pain. And that's the best kind of product is when this, when the individuals that you're trying to, to the audience you're trying to target, they have the pain and you have a real answer for that pain. Anything else. Yeah, it's nice. Doesn't mean you're going to do it, or it might be for a subset of people. But if you can a target a pain that many people have, that is your first step to possible success if you have a way to solve that better than anyone else out there in a way that's transformative. And so is it easy to bullshit yourself when you answer these whys? Like I could build something and say, oh, why, what, what, how is this a painkiller? Why is this a painkiller? What problem is it solving? And I could easily rationalize and come up with something. How do you, how do you avoid kind of smoking your own crack? Because you tell trusted friends and smart people you know. You don't go tell your parents because they'll say it's always great. But you go and you tell you, you tell people who you really respect, who are not just geeks, but they think like, you know, they're they think like product marketers or marketers or other people and or or just people you trust who are good, you know, thinkers, and you say, here's what it is, and pitch it in that. I, I used to do that with the Nest thermostat. I would pitch people and go, let me tell you this. And they go at the end, they go, this makes total sense. Or they'd ask me all kinds of questions about it, and I would refine the pitch. And this is well before we ever made that built the company or actually made the first prototypes or whatever. It's all about talking to people and understanding the pain that they have and giving them the solution and trying to articulate it in a good enough form that they go, oh, that makes sense to me. Okay, move on. Right. But it has to be trusted people. You don't ask them for the solution. 
you give them the solution and then ask them questions and have them ask you questions about why that's going to be transformative for them. And that's the key when you can get enough people going, yeah, shaking their head and they would pay for it. Not just they were going to give it to them, give it to them free, but they would pay for it. You say, you would have to pay this much for that. Would you do that? Like Steve, that's what Steve would do all the time, especially with the iPhone or other new things. He would go around and talking the story to everyone and refining it over time. That's why when he would get on stage, he would get on stage and have such a fluid presentation, hmm. you know, unveiling something to the world because he had been telling that story and refining it over months and months and quarters while that, that product was in development. And so when you're talking to people and you're going through this process, I feel like positive information or positive feedback that they give you is not as useful as negative feedback Agreed. in the sense that like, if they say, yeah, I'd love this. There could be many reasons why they're saying it. They could, they could be saying that because they love it, or they could be saying it because God, I can't wait to get Tony off the phone. I got to just say yes. Yeah, right. But you got to pick the right people and go, I want to hear what you really think. Don't mm. just bullshit me. Tell me I you're my friend. And if you don't tell me, and I trust you, if you don't tell me the truth, I'm going to go commit four or five years of my life, 10 years building this company and this product. I need the truth from you. Please tell me the truth. And if you're, if you, if you can't get that from people, you're not talking to the right people. And so when you were making, uh, as an example, like, and I want to talk about Nest also, but in this context, but when you were making the iPhone, this is basically the first time people experienced a phone with a touch screen, or at least the first time I experienced one. There were phones with touch screens before. But you know what? Nothing existed for me before the iPhone, <laughs> except the, the Blackberry existed for me. I loved the Blackberry and I loved the keyboard and I wasn't sure I was going to get comfortable with the touch screen typing. Like it was a different kind of experience. And what, so what feedback did you get on that that made you decide, okay, yeah, people are going to use this? Well, yeah, exactly. Because we were all like, you know, I had been building even from General Magic touchscreen based devices with keyboards, right? And so, and we knew that the Crackberry was so amazing for people, at least in a business context, and they loved it because they were messaging all the time. And so to, to say, we're going to go up against the Crackberry, the number one kind of productivity tool at the time, it was a huge, you know, huge discussion and argument inside the company. I put, uh, you know, kind of chapter and verse on this inside the book about that and how Steve stuck with, we're going to make this work. Just like we were talking about earlier, we're going to make that touchscreen work. And so there was a series of tests and trials and, and, and changes that were made till we could feel comfortable that we could make it work. Now, would it work as well as a, as a, a Crackberry keyboard? No, but was it good enough? Yes. So it was, are we going to get new users in or are we going to move Crackberry users over to the iPhone? Well, we were all about the new users. We didn't really care too much about the business segment. We cared about the users who were using feature phones at the time and moving them into this because they were using only 12 key keypads. We were moving them into a touchscreen keyboard as opposed to moving people away from the BlackBerry. And that was the, that was the real difference. And we were able to make the technology work, right? Because we had multi-touch display. We had all the software capabilities. We had speed. So it was fast to move and, and different types of audit, auditory feedback and all those things. All of those things had to come together for us to fully commit, you know, within, you know, 80%, 90% of success, because it took months of tuning after that to say, we're going to cut and go this way and challenge Crackberry when it was the number one device at the time. And I guess also you had the stickiness of you know, the iPod and iTouch. So you had like iTunes and, you know, if people wanted their, all the functionality of the iPod, they kind of needed the iPhone. Like here it was a combination of everything. Right. The, the difference though, is you, you know, it was a music and video device, which is purely for consumption on the iPhone. You had a, you had a creation device. You had a, you had to create texts, you had to create emails, you had to do, mm. you know, internet web browsing, that kind of stuff. You, that keyboard had to work. Whereas we had no keyboard and that's the reason why we didn't have the iPod plus phone because there was no keyboard. The keyboard was essential. It had to work, maybe not as well as the Crackberry, but it had to work better than, you know, anything else out there. I mean, think about it. Like how many, how much has changed, how, how better life is because <laughs> of the iPhone. And by the way, I said the iPhone, but then the Android also, which depending on the story, maybe took features from the iPhone or, but whatever, but that whole, do you think if the iPhone never happened, somebody would have made the iPhone or something like the iPhone? 
I'm sure somebody would have stumbled to market with something and it would have taken a long time, probably another decade to finally get to fruition. It probably wouldn't be what it looks like today or started to look like because it still looks the same now 15 years on. So if you think back, you know, the first Android devices, if you look at them, they actually had a Crackberry keyboard on them. Even They had a touchscreen oh, and that. a Crackberry keyboard. So, you know, things, you know, evolution does happen and it can happen slowly. In this case, this was a, you know, a, 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 a Cambrian explosion because we made that revolutionary leap by putting all of these things together in one package. Yeah. And, and then around, I guess it was about two years after there was also then the, the iPad, which again, changed my life. Like, oh, I didn't need to carry a laptop around. I just have this tablet I could take on the train and surf the internet and write emails and it was big screen. So it wasn't just trying to read on a phone. Uh, that was amazing too. I know uh, you probably didn't work on that one or, or wasn't as involved. Well, we did, we did the iPod touch. So the iPad was the oh, it's iPod, just a big touch iPod touch. touch. Right, exactly. So you think about this. If you look back in early 2000s, everyone was trying to take either a Windows computer, or Microsoft was doing this, Microsoft Mobile or whatever, and they were trying to scale down those big computers into this small thing and trying to get everything packed into it. And then you had feature phones kind of being still mobile phones like from SMS days and adding more features onto it. What we did is we took the iPod and grew that up an entertainment device into a productivity device. Everyone else was taking productivity devices and trying to still make smaller productivity devices, right? So it was a very different mindset and approach to the market and different technologies necessary to do that. So from the entertainment side and personal use side, not from the corporate side. So then, well, well first, when you, when you were first working on all this at Apple, did you get a sense that Steve, was seeing 10 years out and thinking to himself, I'm going to totally change the music industry and I'm going to totally change the phone industry. And then maybe I'll kick a few other industries along the way. But did you get that sense? He was thinking of everything. Look, Apple was fighting for its life quarter to quarter to quarter. Yeah. The iPod was a huge bet. Apple had never done any devices outside of that. So outside of a Mac you know, or a computer oriented. Device. Oh, wait, what was, what was the device in the early nineties? They did, um, Newton. that was, yeah, the Newton. Yeah. Yeah. Well that died. Steve killed off the last best vestiges of that in I think 98, 99, but, okay. um, but yeah, no, no, that was like another general magic thing. Um, at the same time. In fact, there's a whole movie about this called uh, general magic movie, which talks about Newton and general magic and what happened because both of them were born out of Apple and all the tensions and everything. It's a great movie and a story about failure and rebirth. But, um, but yeah, no, Apple had really, you know, had tried and failed at consumer electronics, but was still just a computer company at the end of the day. And so to, to make the leap to iPod, it was very difficult. And then to make the leap to iPhone was even more difficult because the iPhone was going to cannibalize the number, you know, the number one growth business inside of Apple, right? To think that you're like, oh, I'm now sitting on a gold mine and you're gonna now undermine it and say, I'm gonna replace it with something else. Those take bold leadership strokes from someone who is a parental CEO, not a babysitter or a CEO. You're going to actually take these risky steps and put the company in harm's way to make sure you get to the next stage, right? Then after that, it became relatively much more easy, right? grow it up into the iPad and then so on and so forth, or shrink it down into the, into the Apple watch. All of those things were all, you know, coming off of that or accessories for AirPod. But those fundamental jumps were huge at a time when Apple was not strong like it is today, nowhere near as strong as it was today. That takes leadership. That takes guts. I wonder if that's why with such strength today, do you feel a company like Apple gets less hungry? and uh doesn't innovate the same way or do you think these innovations were so primal <laughs> like this is the first usable music player this is the first phone integrated with the computer or one of the first like uh uh do you think that space for innovation is is over i think when you're highly constrained you're highly creative and look mm -hmm. apple was highly constrained in each of those periods that said apple is innovating like crazy you just don't it doesn't see it doesn't appear the same from its services perspective, it's in innovating. If you look at the M1 processor, which I'm using right now to talk to you on, 
that thing is an incredible tour de force of engineering. It is going to change, and, and the fact that Apple has the entire stack, software all the way down to the base metal hardware for the, uh, the I, I, iPhone, the uh, Apple Watch, the computers, you know, even AirPods, right? All of those things are full stack products. Now, when Apple has that ability, it has a superpower that no other company has, and it can innovate faster and faster and faster. It may not seem like there's all these things coming out right now from the consumer perspective, but those things take time to, uh, you know, these, these fundamental technologies at the base take time to, you know, grow a root ball and sprout up. It will come over time. You just have to wait, just like multi-touch. Now it's all over the place, right? You just touch ID, right? Face ID. Mm. All of these things yeah. take time to build, perfect, and then allow them to be seeded into products all around and see where they go from there. So I don't believe that Apple is not innovating. Apple is absolutely innovating in a different form. And I'm sorry, it might not be what people want, but it is absolutely the fundamental things for it to set the stage for the next fundamental huge product out there, whatever that may be. And so, so when you left Apple, then suddenly I, I like how you describe it in the book, but suddenly you were, you had something that was annoying you, which is basically temperature control in a house. Right. Like describe, More pain. like More pain. I, yeah. So, so like, what was what was going on in your life that this became like a big pain point? Like, describe your initial uh, conception of Nest. <laughs> so, over a course of eight years, over a course of eight years, I, uh, you know, my wife and I, we bought a place up in Lake Tahoe, and we would go up there each weekend. And during the summer months, or excuse me, the winter months, it was incredibly cold, right? And so, you we either had the choice of leaving the heating on all the time, so that when we got there we would, you know, it'd be comfortable or turning it off and then waiting 24 hours because it was a radiant heat and all that other stuff, 24 hours for it to warm up the place and, you know, either waste money or be cold for, you know, 30% of your vacation, which were you get the week, weekend vacation. And so I was hacking in the background thermostats, uh, cooking up to phone lines, trying to do that even before the iPhone. So trying to make that work. And so ultimately, when we went to go build a house, another house up there, I wanted the greenest, most environmentally friendly at the time. And I, and I was working on the iPhone at the time. I said, oh, my God, this is the remote control of my life. I could use this to then communicate up to the house and change the thermostat. So I was looking for people who was like, oh, thermostat, thermostat. Nobody was doing it. They were still the same products. Ten, you know, eight years from when I started the project, they were the same project uh, products. No one had innovated. I was like, "What the hell?" The I iPhone came out. No one's changed anything. I was like, "Shit, I got to make it myself." Who else is going to do it, right? Because they didn't, they didn't have the skill sets at those thermostat companies to do so. So that's how Nest was born, out of discomfort, absolute discomfort, and real displeasure, and really, I was just pissed off. I was like, "God damn it! I want to stop wasting money, but I want to be comfortable." Ta-da, Nest thermostat. And and it seems like once you have all the pieces in place, like, okay, how do you communicate with a thermostat over the internet? How do you then change the settings on the thermostat, you know, digitally? Because like old thermos, most thermostats then, it probably wasn't even digital the way it is now. Right, right. So, so once you had all the pieces in place, was it relatively easy to make, to actually manufacture and make? Well, we were a startup, right? We weren't Apple. So we had to build the whole team and we had to do it on a shoestring budget with people who were like a thermostat, all this, we talked about the entertainment stuff. And now you're going to do something so practical. Like why are people going to get in, interested in buying a thermostat? And I'm like, because it's really important. You know, it, you're, it's, you're spending $1,500 to $2,000 a year that controls that energy spend. So it's like, we're going to, you're going to pay maybe five to 10 times more than you would normally with a thermostat. So it wasn't just it just fell in your lap. Again, why, 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 why? Tell me why I should spend $250 on a thermostat when I've never even come close to that. Why should I, you know, change all this stuff out? Everything works just fine. So it, it came with a, 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 a blend of rational reasons and emotional reasons why you needed this device. And it took off like that. Now, it wasn't easy to build, but luckily we had all these great people from the iPod team, General Magic, the iPhone team. We all came together and built this thing in, in, a, in a span of 18 months. The, a company from scratch and the device and shipped it in 18 months. And we didn't know if it was going to be a success. We, were, we, we thought it would be. And then, boom, 
we were sold out within, I think, like two minutes online when we first announced it. And describe how that happened. Like, how were you initially getting the word out? Initially getting the word, we just, we went, we were doing, well, there weren't that many podcasts at the time. So we were doing, uh, we were doing different, uh, you know, blogs. So we were going around doing the typical PR thing. We were, I was getting on TV and, and talking about it, showing it off. And it just captured the imagination of a lot of people. And uh, it was just a lot of hard work, elbow grease running around and, and, and trying to start a fire and get people to, you know, to pay attention. And they did, and they did very quickly, which we were, wow. thank, we were so thankful. And we were sold out. We couldn't meet capacity needs. You know, we, were, we, we, didn't, we didn't manufacture enough for the longest time. Even, even when the orders kept coming, we could only expand manufacturing so fast to be able to meet demand. And that way, I think it was like two, two and a half years till we actually were able to catch up with the demand for the Nest thermostat. You know, it was such an amazing product. And then how long after the release did Google buy you guys? So then after that, we did the, the smoke and CO detector, which was another big hit. And then right after that, about um, uh, five, six months, we got bought. So it was about uh, four years. From, okay. from inception before we were shipping, inception to the time four or five years to, to, to sell Nest. And, and you know, you, you discuss in the book a little, but why do you think, what are all the reasons Google wanted to buy a thermostat? You know, well, Google, I think of as like uh, an information company to some extent, but obviously they're much more than that. But what, what did they want? Well, first we had a team. We had a team from Apple. Right. And they were always jealous of Apple in terms of the products and stuff like that. So they were like, oh, well, we can get this team. Right. Because we were fundamentally, you know, the team was building the, the iPod and then a big part of the iPhone. Secondly, um, they wanted to get into this space. And they said specifically, and this was what Sergey said, is the thermostat, uh, the thermostat is, uh, passes the toothbrush test. Do I use it every day? Right. And if I use it every day, just like Google search, then it has a chance of success. So thermostat's important. Everyone needs one and I use it every day. So they're like, okay, it passes the toothbrush test. It's got a great team. The product is well rated. Customers love it. We have them in our homes, da, 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 da. And they have these new products coming out in our roadmap. So it was all of those things together. I love that concept of the toothbrush test. Is there anything you could think of that's successful that doesn't pass the toothbrush test? Oh, sure. There's all kinds of, you know, apps and things of that nature that you don't use every day or you don't need to use every day. Toothbrush, you obviously should use because it's for your health, but there's lots of things. You don't have to use social media, but people do, right? Yeah, it's that's a true. success. But you do, but you get the feeling that you have to use it every day after you use it for a while because it becomes addictive. Really? I can't yeah. stand Facebook. I don't touch it. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I, I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% 
when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M I Z Z E N and Main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Let's ask about products that haven't worked. Like, and you you talk about, you you were talking to Jeff Bezos about joining the Amazon board and he was pitching you on the Kindle Fire. And I remember I was actually in the audience in, I think it was in L, in Santa Monica where he, or L, LA, where, when he released the Kindle Fire and seemed like a good idea to me at the time. But like, what, what, made, what made you think it was like too much? Because iPhone has a lot of features too. But what was the Kindle Fire? Why was that too much for you? Well, I, I looked at it and I said, what are, what are Amazon's core strengths? I said, what are your core strengths? What do you do differently than everyone else? And what can you deliver differently than everyone else? And I was like, content, content, content. You deliver content. You deliver products too, but you deliver content and you um, that you produce in some cases yourself, like Audible. I think they had Audible at the time. Um, yeah. And so you're great at content production. You have this ebook thing called Kindle. Kindle is uniquely yours. It's e-paper, it's of ebook format, it's uniquely yours. You can claim it yours. You can't claim the smartphone. You can't claim the ta color tablet, you know, a regular display tablet. What are you gonna do that's so different that you couldn't just sell everybody else's stuff and then sell and just have a software that you load on it to make it turn into the device you want for content, you know, content consumption? Why go through all this work when you got everybody else making the devices and you really can't do much for differentiation? on those devices. And then they were like, oh, well, we can do this, you know, this weird 3D touch thing and that, you know, you could see the screen in 3D and it was like, it was all gimmicks. Nothing was, mm. nothing was uh, essential, right? And that right, was so the all you're saying. It was over-engineered. It was just feature rich for geeks. It was, there was no why, it was what. Right, so you're saying like the iPhone, which, you know, was a new, the phone business was a new business for Apple, but you're saying a, it was an extension of what you were already doing, as you described earlier, like it was kind of iPod, iTouch, and then, you know, you have to figure out how to add these phone capabilities. Mm -hmm. But, and you were also adding something distinctly new, like the, I, you said there was touchscreen phones before then, and I believe you, but I didn't know about them. And <laughs> so you were making kind of a, you were entering a relatively new market in the phone market, whereas, the, you know, everybody was already using an iPhone or an Android. Why would they switch from that, those ecosystems to 
the, uh, the, the fire, the Amazon fire. Yeah, especially when you could just add the software on top of it as a downloadable app and they get, they turn that device into their own device. And I was very clear, like Kindle is the manifestation of the Amazon brand in the physical world, right? Besides the boxes and everything else, Kindle was a product that was a manifestation of their brand in, the, in, a, in a hardware form. If you put an Amazon on a on a phone or whatever, it's not unique enough. Everyone's like, "Oh, is that a Samsung thing? Is that a you know? Is that a LG or some other brand?" Amazon, uh, uh, Android phones are Android phones, right? For the most part, you know, there's slight differences. But the ecosystems and the software on top of them are different, and that's where Amazon could really benefit and and really own things. So, like, how would you have extended the Kindle, maybe? To, in, in a way that wasn't a phone, was there, is there any extension to the Kindle's, uh, you know, features at that time that would have excited you? Well, I think that, I think the Kindle was exciting just in and of itself. It actually had to get paired back. If, if you don't recall, the first Kindle actually had a hardware keyboard like the, the Crackberry. So they yeah, actually, they shrink down all kinds, they finally made it really simple and that's when it took off. When it came out, it was, it was over featured again. There was a lot of what, not enough why. And when they discovered the why and they listened to customers, they, and this is to your point about, well, would, if, would the iPhone have existed if Apple didn't do it? it? It, the Kindle evolved into what it was today and it was over featured, overdone because it was just about what throwing things together as opposed to why. And they finally got there because customers told them what it, what they wanted. Right. And, and they, and they, they evolved into the, the form factor it is today. And then a, a, another product that I was super excited about before it launched, and then it was just a disaster. You mentioned in the book, uh, Google Glass. <laughs> yep, Google Glass. Like, I thought it was going to be this incredible thing. Like, oh, I could be walking around, but also surfing the internet through my glasses. <laughs> but you took the bait. Really... You took the bait. I did take the bait, and I'm, I'm gullible that way. So what, what do you think... I mean, obviously it just wasn't really that usable. It, made it my was eyes what, hurt and... it was what, it was no why. Yeah. There was oh, no, no but there why. is a why though, which is, um, what? I'm looking at something and suddenly I see things about it on, on Google. Like, let's say I'm looking at a, 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 a building and the Wikipedia page for the building shows up and I could learn about it or I don't know, I'm making that up. Yeah, but... Yeah, yeah, right. But that, that was a product. This was just like general magic. It was a product before it's time. Yes they sold you something that it could do in the future, not what it could do today. So when you got all this marketing and look at all this cool stuff, when you took it out of the box and you tried it, none of those things existed. None of that stuff was real. You had to deliver on the promise. You can't just sell people, especially when you're paying for something, you can't sell people on a vision and then not deliver it, <laughs> right? You, right. It, and then what happens is you pissed off all the early adopters who want that technology. They want to believe. They want to be religious zealots and believe, believe, believe. And when you do that and you disappoint them, believe me, all hell breaks loose and they can't stand you. They're like, I wasted my money. I'm screaming. I'm yelling. What did you do? And so you piss off a lot of the most, you know, the influencers in the, in that world, you can't do it. You have to deliver. And that's why people were like, when the, when the iPod came out, when the iPhone and the Nest came out under, you know, I, I, how can I put that set expectations low and then over deliver. Yeah. <laughs> right. And it, it delivered cause it had people like, I couldn't believe how full featured the I, uh, the iPhone was with, with all the different apps that came out of the box. There wasn't an app ecosystem. Apple made all the apps right? It had all these apps on it right out of the box. People are like, oh my God, it feels like a real complete product. Like when I get a V1, a V1.0, it doesn't feel like that. It's always something's missing, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't like that with the iPhone. It hit m m almost all the things. And then all the crazy stuff people envisioned for it, that was their imagination of it, not what Apple was communicating that it could deliver. Now over time, it then filled into, filled in all the blanks that people had and visions that they had, but, and there's still more visions to come. And, and when you got to Google after they bought Nest, were you able to kind of influence product design and groups outside of the Nest? Well, I, I did go and take over Google Glass for a while um, because it was just floundering. And I thought I, I knew a, a, a better way of doing it. And I told Larry and Sergey, let me take a whack at this because Ivy Ross was, was working on it and she had great ideas, wonderful ideas, and she needed a partner. 
And so, and I, Ivy and I are, are good friends and, and uh, became good friends through it. And she and I were uh, uh, partners in crime trying to reboot Google Glass into the right thing. And there's a lot of interesting things that can be done. And I can see those things could, could be done in the AR and XR glasses that we're talking about, you know, now are being talked about. And I'm looking forward to seeing those things come to fruition over the, you know, the, the years to come. Yeah. Well, if you had to place a bet on VR or AR, what would you, what would you bet on? I wouldn't bet on either. I think both of them have reasons to exist. So uh, let me get like VR, let me get, well, besides gaming, right? I don't believe in the metaverse, fuck the metaverse. I do believe in VR for lots of things. So we, we invested in a company called Gravity Sketch, which is collaborative 3D design in a virtual world so you could actually make real products. The, the 2D world of design and translating the 3D and going back and forth is really hard and it takes very it takes experts to learn how to do that and translate. When you can design and build and manufacture and everything in a 3D space, it's amazing what can happen, especially collaborative. So Gravity Sketch is a great example of a problem that needed to be solved in a whole new way in, in, in VR. In AR, I have seen some amazing things like, um, you know, see what I see. Envision yourself as a doctor working on a patient or something like that, and you have the glasses on. And all of a sudden you're having an issue and you say, uh, you know, hey, I need an expert. And an expert can look through your glasses and see what you're looking at and go, and you say, hey, I'm having this issue. This is not working, that's not working. What would you suggest? And that expert sees what you see and says, I would do this, do that, try this, and watch you do it. That yeah, is that's, so powerful. That's great. So VR or AR, it, that's a false choice. I think yeah, metaverse or no metaverse, that is not a false choice. Solving problems, solving pain. Metaverse is not a pain. I mean, and but but like games aren't a pain. But at no. the same time, I keep asking my kids, is there any of this metaverse stuff that you enjoy being on? Or is it just about people like writing articles in Forbes, make it flipping real estate near Snoop Dogg? And they don't even, my kids don't even know what the metaverse is. So they no. had never even heard the term before. No one does. This is a fabricated term by companies trying to say that they have the next great idea when they don't. Um, this is, you know, look, you and I are going to meet in the metaverse. You and I are going to meet in the metaverse and we're going to go dancing and we're going to make a human connection. You can't make a human connection when you can't look into the other person's eyes, into their soul and try to make a connection. If everybody's just this blank thing and regardless of how how great the CGI is, give me a freaking break. Those micro expressions with that glint in your eye, I can see it, you know, I can look through your glass, I can see it and I can say, I like this person, I don't like, I, I don't trust them or I, I really think, or I'm falling in love. You can't do that in the metaverse. Maybe you could, it's just another place for trolls to exist because they don't make a human connection and trolls love not making human connection. That's what they exploit, lack of communication because they wanna, you know, uh, trumpet whatever it is so they get their own attention if trolls wouldn't do what trolls do if they could look into your eyes and they have to say it to your face in the metaverse it's just another form of trolls and i agree and it seems really odd that facebook has basically bet the whole bank on you know they changed their name they made all these videos of what their vision of the metaverse looks like and it's like the opposite way in which they in which Mark Zuckerberg initially made Facebook. It was this tiny site for a tiny community and just grew bigger and bigger as the use cases evolved. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is the opposite. Like the use case doesn't exist and he's got to spend like a trillion dollars to make it exist. I think he spent it's, something it, it, like 40 to $50 billion so far on the so-called metaverse. Yeah, so, so nobody's ever like started a business like this completely from the top down without even knowing if it's going to be used. It's almost like destined to fail, like why would he do that? He's just, obviously he's a smart guy. Like why would his team do it? Well, look, they need constraints. They need to solve a problem. What they're trying to say is, and this is what always happens, and I've seen it in my 30 year career, people think they're gonna build a platform and then everyone will come and figure it out. Google Glass was this, we're building a platform and everyone else will figure out the applications iPhone wasn't like that. iPod wasn't like that. Nest wasn't like it. You first start and solve real hard problems, painkillers for problems that many people have. And then if people like that, you can extend it so other people can solve other pains. And then it becomes a platform. You have to solve a problem first, then you have the right to become a platform. 
You can't do it the other way around. The metaverse is a platform looking for a problem and other people to fill in the blank, just like Google Glass was. That isn't going to, that is not, I've never seen that successful. Well, what was, what was the problem Twitter was solving back in like 2006? The problem it was solving? I think it was solving, you know, communication. It was a broadcast platform, right? I want to mm. broadcast my thoughts out to someone in text, right? There was no one to many. And that was what Twitter was. And that was and a pain is. point that people were experiencing? Well, people wanted to have their bully pulpit and say whatever they wanted to say, right? It was just like the town square. We're hearing about that now. You stand in the town square and you have your sign and the crazy says what the crazy wants to say. And some people listen and they move on. Other people, you know, you know, they turn into cults then or whoever knows what. But it's just a different form of the town square. And so what, what's your pain point now? I mean, other than that, you have to talk to me for a while, but other than that, <laughs> the like... climate, it's not just my pain point. It's all of our pain points. It's an existential sure. crisis that we all need to be a part of solving. Either you're part of the problem or you're part of the solution. There's nothing in between. The climate crisis is real. It's existential. It's not just going to affect us, but every generation to come and our forefathers fucked it up. We got to fix and it. So, and we have a very and, limited window of time to do it. The metaverse ain't going to fix the climate change <laughs> problem. It's just not. So given your skill set and your your capabilities, what, I mean, obviously the Nest thermostat was right. a huge yeah. role in, in solving yes. the problem. What's, the, what, what's next for you? I know you're advising and helping and investing in tons of companies, but it, don't you feel like the urge to start making something again? Like investing is a little boring. Then you, you invest, you can help people out. <laughs> and by the way, they only need your help when they're, when they're hurting. So it gets annoying after a while. And <laughs> that's not how we invest. And we're not investors. We're mentors with money. We don't All invest right. other people's money. I tried to be retired. Retirement sucks. I need to build. <laughs> and now I get to build with so many incredible entrepreneurs around the world who are solving real problems with real whys and real painkillers. And so I actually are in there and, you know, one day I was just down in the fields of, uh, of Central America in the plantations and everything, working on a new agricultural technology business. I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I get to then, like I said, gravity sketch. That's another thing. I get to go work at Menlo Micro and we get to design the product roadmaps and, and, and how the business is going to grow around, you know, the, tra the transistor moment for relays. Relays are everywhere in the world and they're very inefficient and unreliable. How do we change all these relays that switch electricity or uh, RF signals, wireless signals? Fixing that so that we can, 60% of all the energy we produce on this planet is wasted as heat or otherwise. 60%. Let's go fix the inefficiencies. So I'm working on all the inefficiencies. You know, just like you said, Apple's not innovating. Well, they're innovating at the lower levels as well as the upper levels, just not what people think. I'm innovating with all of these companies and helping them to innovate at the lowest level so we can disrupt all the problems, all the inefficiencies in this planet that we're wasting all this energy and trying to, you know, have new technologies to envision new products at the top layer that get rid of these problems. So it's incredibly rewarding, whether that's aqua technology, you know, for, for fish farming or, or shellfish farming or ag tech, or we're doing, we're, we, we deal with uh, semiconductors and sensors. We deal with um, uh, software companies that are working on scope three, scope one through three emissions, like Sweep, that is, is the, uh, one of the number one companies in trying to figure out a, a CO2 footprint for big and small corporations all around the world. All of these things, I get to be a part of that, whether that's telling, asking the whys, helping part of being doing the branding, and our team, not just me, but our team at Future Shape. That's what we go in and do is find these technologies, find these innovators, these scientists, engineers, researchers, and then help them build their story and tell that story in, an, in a huge way to show how they can impact the planet in a positive manner or help impact society in a positive manner or health. So those are the three big pillars of future shape and what we do. So I have fun every day building, building, building. I might not be the guy, you know, you know, coding or whatever else, but I wasn't doing that at Apple or Nest even. You know, I was sitting there, you know, helping to tell the story and build the story. All these other people are working really hard. I get to just do this now. We have over 200 companies that we've direct, directly invested in. I get to help them. We call ourselves mentors with money. And it's so rewarding. I mean, and, and your book is, is great in the sense that it takes all this knowledge you have 
and it becomes like a scalable version of you. Like, cause you talk about hiring, you talk about <laughs> ideation, execution, you talk about, you even talk about how to sell your company. Like what, cause which is by the way, a hard skill. It's not easy to sell your company cause you have to tell your story in such a way that people buy into why you're selling at right. the same time that they write you a check for billions or billions of dollars. So, uh, no, nobody likes to do that. You have to talk to them about it. Yeah. And, yeah. and the book also talks about all the failures along the way and what doesn't yeah. work and why, right? Not just what does work, but all kinds of things that you can see go wrong. So that if it's going wrong for you, you're like, Oh, oh okay. Pattern match. Okay. Let's try something else. Maybe we don't have the, the right answer. At least you know what the wrong, some of the wrong answers are. So build is, you know, taking all the things I've learned over the 30 years, plus all these companies that we work with on a daily basis, all the questions they ask over and over and over. So in a way it was a selfish for me because I'm like, I got to tell the same story again and again on a daily basis. I'm going to just write them down. I'm going to put them in the book. So first, when people ask me a question, I say, buy this, go read right. this, and then come back and talk to me after you've read that. So we can get into second and third and fourth order questions as opposed to the first order ones. So let's say, let's say a young guy, 25 years old or younger or whatever, reads this book, gets all excited, loves everything you're saying. Um, and they, they, they're just not sure though, which industry to go in. They know, okay, environmental stuff's good. Metaverse, not good. <laughs> how should they, how should they start thinking about what industry and what, how they could bring their skill sets? I mean, some things are too complicated for, for people. Like if they, if they're 25 and they haven't already studied X, Y, and Z, there's some industries they're, they're not, they can't go into necessarily. What should that people start looking at? Well, they should go where they want to learn. Hmm. What do they want to, so my, everyone comes in, ah, I just quit my job. Do you have anything for me? And my first question to all of them, including people who I hire on our team or we hired at Nest, whatever, first question is, what do you want to learn? If you can't answer that question, what do you want to learn? I don't want you on the team because you don't know everything, right? No one knows everything. I want to know what you're curious about and what you want to learn because that's what's going to drive you, right? And so I say, what? And if I get a great answer to that and I go, oh yeah, we, you can learn about that here. I'm like, oh, there's, now we're getting in the, we're, we're, we're now finding the right, you know, fit now. Well, okay, what do you want to do within learning that? Da, da, da. So you go from there. But it first starts with what you're most curious and what you want to learn. And if you don't have that and you think you know it all, I don't want you anywhere near here, right? Mm. Because it's not going to be beneficial. When we're learning about new technologies and we're doing things that the world's never seen before, we're not going to know everything either. So we're curious too. We want all kinds of curious people who want to learn and try to figure out new ways of doing things, not just doing things the old way because they already knew what to do. Because almost every new problem has a new way of solving it. Well, you know, it was great uh, hearing about your history and reading about your history of, you know, again, you described the failures at, at general magic or Phillips or, you know, and on and on. And then of course you're my hero for making the iPod <laughs> and then the iTouch and the iPhone and then nest. Uh, Oh, one quick, one quick question. Do you think there's a danger of people hacking nest because that's private information? What, you know, how hot your house is at different times of the day. Look, you got one of these, right? You know how many people are hacking this all day? How much more information is here? You think really yeah, they're going to be, there's no credit card information. People care about stealing things that they can steal money fast. You Thermostat data? Come on, really? Sure, well, somebody might try because they want to hack it and play with your thermostat or whatever else. But criminals go where the money is. <laughs> they don't go where right. just to be a nuisance and just have some fun, sure. There's some, some crazy kids out there who do that. Okay, fine. But that's not going to go take down the planet. Yeah. All right. Good point. Uh, <laughs> that was just a random question I had for, <laughs> for the other, but Tony Fidel, this book is the guide to coming up with an idea, confirming or trying to confirm if you can, if it's a good idea, bad idea, what you need to add, what you need to subtract, and then how you make it, how you sell it, how you hire for it, how you manage it it's really like a guide to, to doing business. So build an unorthodox guide to making things worth making by Tony Fidel. And it was, again, it was great to hear your enthusiasm and, and talk to you. I'm, I'm so excited we had this podcast. So thank you so much. James, thanks for the time. Really appreciate it. I just want to tell all your listeners, um, if you buy build, build all net proceeds 
go to a climate crisis fund that's funding startups and and philanthropic ventures who are helping with the climate crisis. No money comes to me. This is a labor of love. Um, so I match all proceeds by five times. So wow. you buy it, and then I match it five x, and then it goes into climate crisis solutions. Okay. What if what if you sell a billion books? <laughs> Great. Well, no, I have a limit. I can't, you know, I can only go so far. I'm not going to put myself, yeah, I and my family out on the destitute on the street. But I hope it happens that way. And I have to, you know, the the the, the pressure yeah, valves go off. That'd be a yeah. great problem to have. Let's have that. I want everybody Excellent. building. That's the most important. Build for the planet in a positive way. Build for your societies. Build for your health. Do that. That's what we need happening right now. One last thing. Go for you it. Go to the back of the book. It's the sustainability information. It's the nutritional facts of the book. Every single product that you buy should have nutritional facts. It tells you how it was made, whether it was green or not, if it's recyclable, compostable, whatever, or how to recycle. We literally innovated on the format of, you know, you read the book. We innovated on the format of the book, but also nutritional facts to tell you what to do with this at the end of life or how it was made. So we were transparent to tell people on what, and how this book was made. Everything should have that on this planet moving forward. So we're innovating everywhere. And I never thought of that, but let me ask you a question. Tell me if this is bullshit or not. Would this be a real world use case of blockchain, for instance, to basically track every component of the supply chain that led to this product and, and know that it's not you know fraudulent and, and this, it's real? Well, secure databases do the same thing, but it, it, blockchain is one, one further step. But sure, blockchain is just, a, to me, another form of secure database. So yes, databases or secure databases or blockchain, all of those things would be really critical in understanding and understanding the transparency on how things are made and how they're recycled and, and, and a circular, to build a circular economy. So absolutely. Well, again, build an unorthodox guide to making things worth making by Tony Fidel. Thank you so much. And thanks for making the iPod. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, James. Thanks for being a customer. I hope to talk to you again.